So I guess we'll jump right into it with Kevin Zhao, uh, who's the chief economist of Bettercoin, and he is uh, talking on the efficiency of Bitcoin markets. Yes. Hey guys. Hey, how's it going? Oh, it's going well. Could use a few more beers, but uh, otherwise, pretty good. So I'm Kevin, um, and I'm with Buttercoin. I'm the commerce there. And uh, you know, if you don't know Buttercoin, uh, we're a U.S.-based marketplace uh, to trade Bitcoin. So we have a full order book. And you know, I got to get the plug out of the way before we get to this good stuff. Um, but uh, you know, you can uh, you know post bids and asks, um, trade on our marketplace. So if you guys are interested, uh, feel free to check us out afterwards. Um, so today's talk is going to be about you know how efficient are the Bitcoin markets and. Um, you know, I think it's an important topic because you know there's a lot of traders out there, especially in the Bitcoin space, that you know if the markets are efficient, then there's no point in trading, right? Then if you win, it's just lucky, and if you lose, it's just unlucky. Um, so uh, before we can really get to talk about that, I think we should you know just talk a little bit about this guy right here. So this guy, uh, Andrei Komogorov, uh, was a mathematician um, in the 20th century, and uh, you know he pioneered a lot of uh, different uh, fields of mathematics, uh, one being um, algorithmic uh, complexity. And what that basically is, is that, you know, let's say you have some string, right? And you got like A, B 16 times, or you got this really weird, uh, you know, other string right here. And really the complexity of the string is sort of how easily could you describe it um, using an algorithm. So if our, if our universal language that we use uh, was the English language, then we would say, well, the first one is just A, B, 16 times, and it's not that complex. And the second one, well, you would actually have to say the you know, individual characters of that string um, to, uh, you know, to, you know, to, to explain what it is, basically, to, re to reproduce it. Um, so, you know, on that line, uh, oh, okay, well, before we get to that, um, you know, on that line, you know, I think, you know, where I'm going with this is that, you know, one way to look at the efficiency of the markets is just to see how random it is, whatever it means by, you know, random. And one way to do that is to look at, you know, all the returns in the Bitcoin markets and just see, you know, how, you know, how does this compare in its complexity to, let's say, a purely random string, like a generally, uh, a genuinely random string. So, um, you know, let's talk a little bit more about Komogorov first. So, uh, he, you know, here's a fractal. This is a Matterlock set uh, named after another uh, very famous mathematician, also pioneered a lot of stuff. And even though it looks really complex, um, it can actually be replicated with a very simple algorithm. So, you know, it may be a little bit counterintuitive what, you know, complexity really means, but what I'm trying to say is that outside of that, it's just, you know, how easily is it replicable by uh, an algorithm? And, you know, as you can see with this thing, it's sort of like self-similar in the sense that, you know, if you zoom in to individual pieces of it, it'll just look like the whole thing, right? So, you know, to replicate it, you just have to, like, recurse over the same definition over and over again. So it's actually not that complex. So uh, one last bit before we get into uh, market efficiency. Um, I want to talk a little bit about liberalization compression. So what this is, is it's basically a compression algorithm. Uh, for strings, and uh, you know, without getting really into it, it compresses strings by just copy and pasting substrings. And you know, if, you, if there's a lot of patterns in the string, then it's really easy, you know, to compress. And the compressed file becomes the compressed data becomes very small. Um, obviously, if it's very complex, then it's very difficult to compress. And you know, the final output is very similar to the original uh, input. Um, so you know, this is just some math. Doesn't matter. you guys don't really care about it? Don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> But uh, you know, we can we can talk about how we apply this to the Bitcoin markets. So, um, you know, what I did, I, you know, I was coding up in MATLAB a little bit in R. Uh, you know, you take a time series of daily or hourly returns, and you can you you can map those returns to whether you know that was an uptick, a downtick, or or a no tick. And you know, really, this is kind of simplifying it. I mean, there could still be patterns in the market, 
you know, outside of what, you know, what direction it's moving. But you know, even simplifying it, we can take a look a little bit at how efficient the markets are. So if you actually did that, you'd end up with some string filled with you know, zeros and ones, and you can apply this compression algorithm. And you can, comp you can compare the size of this to compressed, truly random data. And depending on what that ratio is, it's sort of a measure for how efficient that market is. Uh, so obviously you want to sample over multiple windows. You don't want to just you know, do one window. Um, so here, here's a couple of results from um, a paper that I was reading. And what they did is, you know, they didn't look at the Bitcoin markets, but they looked at a lot of other markets. And they found that, you know, as it turns out, the German and you know, US markets are pretty damn efficient. You know, it's like, it's almost indistinguish indistinguishable from a complexity standpoint from random strings of you know, up and down and neutral. Uh, and you know, these are basically the top 10 most efficient markets out of the 26 that they've seen, uh, that, they take the, that they took a look at. Uh, here's the bottom 10. So these markets, um, who knows what's going on in them? I, don't, I wouldn't recommend trading on them. Um, <laughs> the, you know, some, something awry is going on over here, uh, but you know, obviously the, the, the compressed string is much smaller than the input data. So it basically means that there's a lot of patterns in that data. So you know, if you're a technical analyst, you know, maybe, you're, maybe you're interested in trading in, in, in some of these markets. If you, know, you do some type of algo trading, uh, that might be a little more interesting. Um, or it just could be you know, a bunch of insider information and they're just, like, they're just making money off of everybody else, right? So uh, there's something uh, strange about these markets. So what about, uh, what about Bitcoin? Um, so with Bitcoin, what we found is that for you know, daily returns, um, the LZ index, which was uh, from the compression algorithm return, you know, whatever that number is, whatever it means, but relatively speaking, comparing it to um, you know, the, the other indexes that were found uh, for these other stock exchanges around the world, it shows that we're pretty close to the Copenhagen and Athex composite exchange in Greece. So if you, if you don't remember what that was, that was in the bottom 10. So it's really just not that efficient. I mean, this is like, I mean, we're, we're beating out, you know, Pakistan, you know, Sri Lanka and Peru, right? But, I mean, it's not, it's not that great, so. Um, and then also, you know, if you want to go down to the hourly level, it's even less efficient. And, you know, we see that Bitcoin on an hourly uh, time frame is even less efficient than the very bottom, which is the Colombo Stock Exchange. Uh, which means that you know, either there's, oh, well, I mean, given that there's no insider trading in Bitcoin, probably very little, um, there's probably a lot of opportunity to you know, develop algorithms or trading strategies to uh, generate positive returns. Go ahead. Can you define what you mean by efficient in this context? Uh, by efficient, I only mean according to this measure, which is that uh, from you know, looking at the returns, uh, of the Bitcoin markets and comparing them to returns that would truly be random. Right? So like if you just took a truly random string and you compared that to the string that was represented, that was mapped from the Bitcoin returns, like how do they compare in terms of their compressibility? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to add that I think you're assuming that if there are no arbitrage opportunities, then it's completely random. But if, there, if it's not completely random, then there are arbitrage opportunities. And that means that, and like, it's like basically we say a market is efficient if there are no arbitrage opportunities. Right? Yeah, I, I wouldn't say that's the case. I think a market's efficient if you can't predict the future based on past historical data. Okay. So there doesn't need to be um, arbitrage opportunities for you to do that. Like let's say like the market always follows like a U pattern over and over again. Mm -hmm. Like even if there were no arbitrage opportunities, you would still be able to say that, hey, it's at the bottom of the U, it's probably gonna go up next, right? But does that mean that, how does that have to do with efficiency? Right, so what I'm saying is that as long as you can't predict future prices based on historic data, okay. then, then the market's efficient, right? And otherwise it's, it's not very efficient. And uh, we're, we're using a proxy here of the compressibility of those returns mapped onto, um, you know, using the, the LZ algorithm. So there's a couple caveats here. Um, you know, first of all, you know, with Bitcoin data, there's not that many days to sample from. So obviously, you know, this might not be statistically significant, even though, uh, you know, it suggests something. So obviously, you know, as as we as time goes on, we'll have more data. We'll be able to see, you know, with more certainty uh, that this was the case. 
Uh, there's also the question of whether or not we should use a binary or ternary uh, alphabet, as in, should we say that you know there's only upticks and downticks, or they you know upticks, downticks, and uh, zero ticks. Uh, outside of that, there's the choice of the compression algorithm. I chose the LZ algorithm, but you know Kolmogorov complexity itself is a very abstract concept. It's basically what's the shortest algorithm necessary to replicate a string, but you know how, how would you ever be able to tell what that was, right? So you, you have to kind of proxy it with some type of you know, practical algorithm to compress that string. Um, the other thing is that Bitcoin markets really evolved really quickly. So you know, like, uh, even just like a year ago, it's probably, it was probably a lot less efficient than it is today. So uh, you know, that's just something to keep in mind. Um, I think that you know, things have improved quite a bit. I've, I've, looking, I've taken a look at some other signals and uh, uh, you know, I think uh, using a support vector machine just even six months ago, I was getting 66% accuracy out of sample on upticks versus downticks. Um, but now, you know, I think just uh, two months ago, I was testing that again, and uh, out of sample accuracy was down about 60%. So, you know, I think the Bitcoin markets, as more people move into it, as it gets more liquid, um, it just gets more efficient overall. Uh, the other thing is that efficiency uh, may vary across different exchanges. So you know, uh, if you look at Bitfinex versus you know Bit Bitstamp, might be different. The Chinese exchanges is probably very different, but I mean, who knows really? Um, so you know, just a couple things uh, to, to keep in mind. And uh, you know, so so now that you know we're somewhat convinced um, that the Bitcoin markets are not very efficient, even for uh, fairly long time frames, um, how do we go about actually making predictions? on you know, where the price is gonna move next. Like if it was actually inefficient, then there should be some way to generate, to generate excess returns, right? Um, well, there's actually a number of ways to do that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's some references if you guys are interested. If not, you know, it's cool. Uh, go ahead. Question. What motivation between introducing like the But what, what sort of statistical methods do you have to measure market efficiency? Well, essentially, you're trying to measure randomness here. And right. more complex is about the, the length of an algorithm to generate the particular sequence. Right, that's right. Well, what's so, so what I'm saying is if you take the time series of return data, uh -huh. then if it were truly random, it should have the same complexity on average as a truly random string, right? Okay. So this would be some way to measure efficiency. Right? Like, how, how else would you measure it, right? Like, you could use statistical models to sort of predict, based on historic data, where the price is going to go, but how about overall market efficiency, like that, that concept of efficiency? How would you go about measuring that? Yeah, go ahead. Well, actually, that, I want to do a riff on his question. So did you guys ever look at, like, uh, KS tests to, like, test the uh, hypothesis that it's, like, following black holes or whatever? Uh, I don't think that, it doesn't look like it does. Sure, so Black-Scholes is for options pricing. It's okay. not It's not really about the underlying. You can, do it, you can do it for You can do it for daily returns, like logarithmic returns. You, think. you can like model like the logarithmic return of a, of a no, stock. Black-Scholes is an options pricing formula. That's, that's no. not fair. Oh, okay, I'll There's talk to you offline about it. Okay. <laughs> Actually, my, my background's kind of in options pricing, so, um, but then when, so, for, you know, so I gotta say a couple things here. First sure. is that Black Scholes is, for, you know, for options pricing, and the second thing is that Black Scholes isn't really that good. Yeah, it's not good. So, great. Right. Uh, go ahead. Do you guys have any other compression algorithms? Do you have those those compares with what you got now? Uh, no, that's what we should do. Yeah, okay. yeah okay. you're right, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I was curious as to which exchanges you were looking at to generate your measures of efficiency. Uh, I was looking at Bitfinex and Bitstamp, but we should look at more exchanges. Yeah, yeah so I'm a completely new to Bitcoin, so if these are dumb questions, I apologize, but I do oh, know options sure. pricing. Uh, in, in the caveat section, uh, would you include bid offer and the inability to short as, as caveats in terms of the advantage of the efficiency of the account? Oh yeah, to take advantage of them, yeah, you definitely have to take them into consideration, just like exchange fees and other frictions, right? Like even like withdrawing and depositing, if that's significant, then you should you know think about that. Yeah. Hi, you may have mentioned this, I apologize, we did, but 
you uh, so so there's a duration, right? Uh, an hour or a day sure. or a minute. Uh -huh. I'm guessing that with different durations, your outcome or your result would be quite different. Yep. And so then, how do you determine what duration to you know to go with? Uh, well, the, really, it tells you a couple different things, right? So, are daily returns efficient or inefficient? Are hourly returns inefficient or efficient? And then so on. Uh, from what we've found, you know, the lower that you go and you know, the higher that you go in frequency, the more inefficient it gets. So, you know, obviously, for very long time frames, it's probably pretty efficient. I mean, that's to say, from you know, the past historic data sense. Obviously, fundamental news can obviously change things, right? Like if the U.S. government all of a sudden says that Bitcoin is the reserve currency of the world now, you know, we're adopting it. Well, that, I mean, that's going to move the price outside of you know analyzing historic data. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Have you looked at higher frequency, five minutes, one minute? Uh, that's for you guys to do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you have. <laughs> I'd imagine it'd be a lot less efficient. Yeah. I uh, got. Yeah, uh, I was thinking that if you were looking to actually take compressibility and turn it directly into a trading strategy, you could just reverse engineer what the LZ algorithm is doing, right? If it says it's compressible in this way using this dictionary, can't you just turn that around and turn that into a trading strategy or not? No, no, this, this isn't really a trading strategy. This is really to see if it even makes sense to have trading strategies. Because if the market's efficient, then, well, I mean, not trading strategies altogether, but just like his, his trading strategies based on historic data. So things like technical analysis or algorithmic trading, like does that even make sense uh, in the first place? Um, and you know, from what it seems like, there, there is something there. Sure, I, I can see how we can use that as a measure of market efficiency, but taking your example of the 32 character string, mm -hmm. if the LZ algorithm is describing it as, you know, A, B repeated 16 times, can you then turn that around and say, okay, I'm gonna use that as a predictor and predict the next two characters are going to be A, B. And maybe, I'd have to think about that, maybe that's possible, maybe. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, um, how far back in the data did you go? I mean, I would assume the market was somewhat different two or three years ago than it is now. So, I mean, you have kind of right. tension between the sample size and right. the market changing all the time. Right, no, I, I completely agree. You know, I think um, more recent data is probably more relevant. Um, and I think that, you know, it's probably more efficient than the time frame that I use. I use a very big time frame. Yeah. So, you so use it like, like going back, years. going back like maybe a year and a half. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, really? yeah, uh, is there a reason you compared equity indices to Bitcoin rather than currencies? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I think the original uh, the original paper was done on that. Okay. And uh, it, I was trying to replicate some of that for Bitcoin and, you know, see if there was any idiosyncrasies to Bitcoin to, you know, keep in mind. Have you compared to currencies by any chance? Oh, I haven't. No, I haven't. Oh, you guys got a lot of work to do. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. It, any uh, comment on what's causing the inefficiencies? Uh, it could be a whole number of things. I mean, I don't know. I mean, probably, I know it's about as much as you guys probably on what causes it. But I think it's just good to, you know, sort of take a look at it. And because, you know, sometimes I'm, you know, having all these training strategies, I think to myself, you know, am I just getting lucky or am I actually doing something valuable, right? Because there's always some type of survivorship bias, right? Like, out of like a thousand people, you know, 10 of them are gonna be right 10 times in a row, right? Something like that, right? So it's like, am I just one of the lucky people or is there like actually something to be made here? And I think, you know, from this, you know, it, it helps me believe that more, that there is something there. All right, cool, awesome.